welcome to Women's Cricket Chat. I'm Hannah. And I'm Alexandra, Alex for short. Coming up on today's podcast, we've got Brazil cricket captain Roberta Moretti Avery. Now, Roberta is a real trailblazer of the game and is always fighting for equality between the men and the women's team. Roberta's also a trailblazer in the sense that she would prefer cricket to be based more on the player rather than gender. Also, just a little disclaimer, there may be some dogs barking in the background, so apologies. Well, how have you been? I've been good. I've been anxious. I, I'm still injured. It has not allowed me to go back training. So I'm still like with a lot of energy that I cannot spend anywhere. Uh, but I'm feeling good because hopefully on Thursday I'll be back training. So fingers crossed here in Brazil. Yeah, no, definitely. And I saw on Twitter as well, you, you've been getting a bit of hate as well. So are you okay? <laughs> yes, he follows me around for some time, but I blocked him on my Twitter. So he moved back to Cricket Brazil Twitter account now, saying that I don't appreciate Indian players and uh, I don't I don't value their stats and things like that. I was like, where are you getting this from? I'm probably the only person in the whole country that watches all Indian matches, female or male, and I know the players' names and I know who is good, who I know the bowlers. I, I have no idea where that comes from. But anyway, some people don't need a reason, do they? But yeah, now he's on Cricket Brazil as well. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's part of Twitter life. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you're okay, though, because I saw it and I was really worried. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, she's not having to endure this as well now, like getting horrible people on Twitter commenting horrible things. But Usually I, I, meet a lot, I met a lot of nice people on Twitter. Yeah. I think it's usually a very good platform to find fans from the world and uh, actually get to know people that love cricket as much as you do. One bad person is not going to make it a big deal. Yeah, no, because I'd really like to comment about the Georgia Adams episode as well. So I sent it to her and she was like, oh my God, it's amazing. Like, Brazil, what? Um, I said, you should just reach out to Roberta. I'm sure she'd like have a chat and stuff. And I was like, you'll have to organise a tour when COVID's all gone and everything. And she was loving it. Oh, I yeah, loved the episode yesterday. <laughs> I, I listened to it while I was doing my first walk since I got uh, hurt and I loved it because she was talking about her captaincy when she started and the experiences she had with uh, the foreigner players. She, she seemed so down to earth, like this person who loves cricket, who works hard for her cricket and the growth, her passion. I really loved it. I listened to Sophie Loops as well right after. Uh, so it was like one podcast after the other yesterday for the whole day. I said, okay. I know. I understand in quarantine now. A lot of podcasts <laughs> on Sunday. So the first question, Roberta, and thank you so much for joining us today as well. It's just simply, how did you get involved with cricket? Well, well, first, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I actually started in cricket not in a traditional way. I lived in England for seven years and I knew what cricket was. I didn't think it was interesting at all because I didn't understand it. I just saw a lot of people in white clothes playing something that I didn't get. So I never was curious about cricket enough while I was living in England. But I married an Englishman and we moved back to Brazil. And by luck, we live in the same city that the president of the Cricket Brazil Association uh, lives. And uh, because both are English, he invited my husband to be part of this social project teaching cricket for kids. And one thing led to another. I went with my husband in a softball a cricket game on a Monday evening. And it was fun, everybody was laughing, it was a great environment. I hit a ball, I found out I could hit it quite far. I said, okay, I think I like this cricket. <laughs> and I kept going uh, for weeks on the Monday night until I actually decided, okay, I wanna give it, have it a, uh, give it a go and uh, try to learn cricket. And uh, it was almost 80 years ago. You used to be a, a golfer as well, is that correct? Yes, so that is correct. It, <laughs> I say, just tell me a little bit about how cricket and golf may link up and what you've kind of taken from golf and put into your cricket. Well, I played golf since when I was 10 years old and I always played it competitively. So when I started playing cricket, uh, golf helped me out a lot because I knew that if I trained more, I would get more from it. And that's something that golf always taught me is an individual sport. So the more you practice, the luckier you are. So I always put a lot of effort in my trainings, in my bowling, in my batting. I didn't need anyone from my team to be with me. I would always be like very dedicated, study a lot, learn all the techniques because I wanted to get better as a cricket player. So that actually helped me 
improve very quickly because I had all that golf dedication, that golf knowledge uh, that came into cricket. Uh, but one thing that also was not so good, because I always played individual sport, when I came to the collective sport, it took me a while to get into that team environment and uh, start understanding that everyone had its own learning speed and their own pace of getting into new things. Because I would demand that everyone would have the same effort, the same, the same dedication that I did because I wanted my team to improve quicker. So actually, it took me a couple of years to move from the individual thinking and going to the collective one and uh, actually being better for my team than only just good for myself. Just quickly, referring back to something you said earlier, you said you'd moved to England. I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on what sort of the difference of living in Brazil versus living in England and were there any similarities? Yes, it was very interesting because I moved to England when I was 18 years old. So I was very naive, very young. Uh, I never lived away from my parents' house and I just, suddenly I was living in the middle of London. So it was a big change. One thing that is beautiful about England that, is that things work. Uh, so if you need, if you go to a shop, you buy something, it does not work, you come back home, you find out about that later, you go back to the shop, you are able to get your money back. Things, the systems work. Uh, in Brazil, the systems don't always work. We are a third world country. Uh, things could be very, very disorganized. So people will say sometime, they will not show up, the things will happen. Instead of happening one month time, they will take like three, four, five months time. It happens from the top to bottom of the country. Uh, it's not very organized. And I loved England because things were organized, things were happening. Uh, and was I, I loved that part of it in my job, in everything that was happening over there. Uh, but one thing that I really disliked was the weather. I could not get used to the cold winters, uh, the gray sky and the winters being very dark. I would go to work, it would be dark, I would come back from work, it would be dark. I'm Brazilian. I love the sun. I love the sunglasses. I love to wake up and be wearing t-shirt and shorts. Uh, so I think the only thing that actually brought me back from England very quickly was the weather. I really missed the sunshine and I really missed uh, the summer from Brazil. I mean, I wish I could be in Brazil right now too, to be fair. Honestly, it's a miserable cold day today. And yeah, I'm in like jumpers. I've got like a blanket and all sorts on the go. Um, but what makes cricket so special in Brazil? Because I know we've already kind of spoken about, we did that article with Emerging Cricket about the history and stuff. But if you could tell our listeners about the history of Brazil and cricket and what make it, makes it so special. Yes. Cricket exists in Brazil since the 1872. The first official game that was played here was more than 100 years ago. Uh, but we only started teaching cricket for Brazilians in the past 10 years. So we developed a project in my hometown, uh, which is teaches cricket for young kids in poor communities. Uh, and we just started with, with one school, one orphanage actually, uh, with 26 kids in 2011. And uh, it, it, it got our attention that the kids loved it. Uh, so we started with the second project in the second year and we are growing exponentially. And since then we are getting the right teachers to teach it for them because we want cricket to be fun, about respect uh, and a fun sport for them to actually play. And it was amazing how they felt in love with it. Uh, so we started with 26 kids in 2018, we had about a thousand kids in 2014, and we finished 2019, which was the last year that we actually had the sessions, with almost 4,000 kids playing cricket in Brazil, uh, with uh, under 13, under 17, under 19 uh, teams only from Brazilians, the women's cricket only from Brazilians, and uh, now with the central contracts with the women's, uh, more than 70% of the girls that are playing pro cricket now are from the social project. So I think the organization of cricket, how it's presented to them and how they see an opportunity in cricket uh, makes a huge difference because they know if, they, uh, if they're playing cricket, they are in a good environment. Uh, usually these schools that we're teaching they do not have other opportunities. So they see cricket as, some, as a way of like, you know what, if I follow this path, I can actually 
play cricket for Brazil, I can join a university, I can get out of this uh, area that I am at that is, if they don't do anything, most probably they will be involved in drugs, they will be involved in something that is not good. So cricket is that path that shows them how to get out of that. So there is a social aspect of it, there is a fun aspect of it, and there's also like, a, it's a great environment to be involved at. Uh, it's a sport presented for them with the, all the good things that you need uh, on that age that you're are just finding what you want to do for a living. Since being involved with cricket in Brazil, how have you seen the game develop? Well, uh, we when we started, we literally had pretty much zero structure. Uh, we, we, we had bats and balls that we imported, not we imported, people from uh, English people or people who are traveling from Brazil, we asked them to bring uh, to bring equipment for us. So we pretty much had bats, balls, wickets, made a, a, a for kids, but we didn't have anything. We didn't have nets, we didn't have a ground, uh, we didn't have teachers. So it was, it started pretty much from scratch. Uh, as years progressed, we were able to make partnerships with a few clubs, uh, partnerships with the government, local government, and uh, to get a place to play, uh, to get a place to practice, uh, to be able to bring more equipment to Brazil. Because it started growing, if, if you have 30 kids playing with you and suddenly you have 2,500 and then 4,000, how can you actually make all of them play? So these partnerships were very important for us. Uh, the clubs, the government, uh, we had Lord's Taverners sending a whole container of equipment for us, I think in 2019, which actually made more than 2,000 kids uh, have a cricket bat at home. And it's their bat, it's their equipment, and they feel like they, they, they take care of it. Uh, you see the, the passion that they have in their eyes to have their own equipment, their own, their own cricket shirts. So we we now in a point that we have our local ground uh, that, is, that is actually a cricket ground. We have two training centers in our hometown, uh, beautiful uh, training centers. We have equipment to be playing with. We have teams, we have a, a central contract. So you can see how much that changed over the years and where cricket is, is going to, to this more professional way. And uh, it is giving the pathway for the ones that are starting. So they actually know, look at cricket and say, wow, that's where I can get to. Uh, when we started, we were just playing for fun and say, okay, you know what, this is fun. Let's keep playing it and let's see where it takes us. It was a big question, ma question mark before, and now it's a certainty. We can actually play cricket and then actually grow in cricket. What you just said as well is phenomenal. Like, especially for people listening to this, can you just explain how short that kind of time period has been as well with all of this development? <laughs> yes, it is very quick. It started the projects in 2011. We had the first people from the social project go into any kind of games, international games in 2014. The junior teams started in 2013. Uh, in 2015, uh, it was when the projects started gaining a big shape. And now it was 20, end of 2019 that we, we opened our second training center. And 2020, we had the pro contracts. So in a in about nine years' time, all of this changed. Uh, and uh, it's going to get much better because in 2020, we had a project to open up for new regions around us. And uh, that actually raised our number to over 30,000 kids because we're going to get three new cities uh, with the whole of their school system uh, to get cricket. And that, that was, I think that's going to be a game changer. Ah, and one thing that was very important. Uh, in 2016 was the first time that we actually put kids from the project into university. Uh, so they started studying schools, uh, sorry, sports uh, in university. And we grant, uh, have, uh, I'm going to say children, but they're not children anymore. They're 18 years of age. They're always going to be my children, but uh, that made young uh, cricket players go into university to become cricket coaches. So every year, two of these kids monitors go into university and they start giving cricket lessons and when they graduate they become development officers uh, so now we have 16 uh, monitors 16 black shirts which is what we call them studying or graduated teaching cricket lessons so 
all of this growth was only possible because we have the monitors going to school and actually saying, I want to be a cricket coach, but I need the graduation to, to do it properly. Because we don't lack people to teach in Brazil. We have 200 million people in Brazil. We lack people that understand cricket that will teach cricket for these kids. So I think that was a big game changer when we actually say, you know what, we are going to make our own coaches and they're going to inspire the new generation of cricketers for us. And then you've already kind of touched on it, but how important has professionalization been for you? Because it's only been this kind of one year anniversary now of becoming kind of full-time professional cricketers. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, that was a big surprise for me when I heard about it. Uh, in 2019, by the end of the South American Championship, we had won uh, the tournament for four years in the past five times. And that was a big change for us because since we started playing internationally in the women's, uh, we had lost everything from 2007 and to 2014. We simply were second place into every single tournament. Uh, you, you can see when it changes, when the, the, the social project players start to join the national squad and actually they were people who trained regularly and were improving, we started winning. So from these uh, first tournaments, uh, we had four players from the national squad going to the United States to play for the America's Development 11 to help on the World Cup qualifier for USA and Canada. So you saw that we were progressing, we were playing and we're improving and we needed a, a, a next step. And uh, that next step would be to play for the qualifiers for the World Cup in the Americas as Brazil. So not only joining by other countries, but actually playing as one country. And we were close to that, but on that level that we're playing, it wouldn't be possible for us to be competitive. We needed to be better. We need to actually spend more time training, more time uh, getting the right coaches, getting the right structure to be able to be competitive on that, on that kind of level. Uh, that's where the professionalization came, came in. Uh, so we had 14 girls last year. We have 16 girls on the Central Protect this year. And uh, that changed everything because suddenly we were people who play twice a week with a focus of playing the South American Championship to people who were playing five days a week with physiotherapy, uh, physical training, uh, mental preparation, uh, coach only for the women's cricket thinking we need to get better because we want to be competitive on a different level now. Uh, we want to play the World Cup qualifiers. We want to play against other countries. We want to go up in the rankings, the ICC T20 rankings. So we need to get this to the next level and make people be able to focus on cricket instead of focus on university internship and everything else. Like, uh, you know what? I can actually focus on cricket and get this better with the support of my confederation. So it was a game changer for us. Uh, we are very happy with it. It's a shame that we started the quarantine came, so we lost about four or five months of it, but we couldn't be happier. And uh, to bring the new girls down the contract just shows that we are going the right path. I'm sorry about my dogs though. They're, they're dying to bark here. It's fine, I just want the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly as well, um, you announced yesterday that you've got those three more players joining uh, Brazil on the professional contracts. Can you tell us a little bit about those three who are joining you? Oh, yes, I'm so proud because uh, these girls, they came from, um, I'm sorry, these girls, they came from a development project that we started here in Poços. So I remember when I went to school, and we did a demonstration for our cricket. So we had a girls only demonstration of cricket. It, we had about 150 girls and the three of them were in the crowd. So they were very shy. Uh, they came in, uh, to the club to have a cricket lesson and they wouldn't say a word. But you know when people are athletes, but they wouldn't say a word. And through all the past, the end of 2019 and then 2020, we could see them playing and they were, training by themselves, uh, asking questions and very excited. And the, one of the girls, her name is Mariane, she's lovely. She had played four kinds of sports before. And the four sports said she couldn't play it because she was overweight. So she came with a very low self-esteem and she couldn't believe that she would play cricket. 
but she was there. She kept fighting. And I look at Maddie and said, Maddie, you are an amazing player. You are a great, you have a great heart. You have great education. Your weight does not matter for us. What matters for me is that I want you to focus on cricket and follow your dreams. So when she got her cap uh, last Tuesday, it was, it, it felt amazing because it proves that you have to have dedication, you have the love uh, and you follow your dreams, you can actually achieve them. Uh, Mari, uh, Mariani was amazed that she, she cried, I cried, everybody cried. But uh, these girls from, they are from the under 17 group, they're joining us now and they are the right fit. They, do, they are not behind us, they are exactly in the right place. Uh, and shows shows that the, the, our pathway is actually working, and there there are people coming from demonstration projects, going joining clubs, joining the teams, and actually getting to the Brazilian squad. So that feels amazing. I, I never felt something like that. Felt like my kids were graduating or something like this. We were talking about how one of your players was feeling self-conscious about their weight. Do you think there is a certain amount of pressure on female cricketers to be a certain weight and to play a certain way? I think not only in cricket, uh, but I think in every sport that is played, uh, mainly when they are teenagers, there is this pressure of look like an athlete. It is is a stigma that we have in Brazil. There is a big prejudice in Brazil on women in sports uh, because it's easy. When we start playing sports, we're 9, 10, 11, 12. Boys and girls are playing together. Everybody's on the same level. Uh, when kids get to 12-year-old boys, they start getting stronger, faster, taller than the girls. Uh, and in Brazil, they're still together. So there's no separation of boys and girls when they are 12, 13, 14. But on this age, the boys are much stronger. Biologically, their bodies are, 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 more, are stronger. They have more hormones. They are, they are going through this phase that they get very big very quickly. And there is a, the management of sports in Brazil on this, this 13, 14 year old is the biggest dropout of girls that you can have because the system is not prepared to treat the girls on the way that they should be treated and they treat boys and girls all together and the girls just drop out. So the stigma is in every sport. So if you are uh, a little bit slower, if you are uh, a little bit overweight, if you are still learning your fundamentals, usually you're left behind and people do not care about you. And that's, I think, where we have a huge opportunity in cricket because the way we set up cricket here is like, we want everyone to play. We don't care what's your level. We don't care what's, if you're good here, if you're not, if you're fast, if you're not. We don't care about your weight. We don't care about your gender. We want you to play cricket. So we have this group of people that are from other sports that never joined other sports because they weren't allowed to or because they were treated differently. And we bring them with love and inclusion and they actually become these great athletes. And even, even if they're not great athletes, if they're just gonna play on their local club or softball cricket, we don't care. We just want them to have fun with a sport. So in, I can say, I can talk about Brazil because that's the reality I live in, but the sports in general, in general are not prepared to handle young girls in the way that they should be handled. And uh, I think that affects their self-esteem a lot because if you manage sports well, with the girls, they learn how to be confident, they learn how to believe in themselves and they become better teenagers and they become better women in the future. So I think that's something key for us to, to remember when you're talking about sports uh, for young girls in every country. Being a female cricketer, have there been any barriers that you've had to face and how have you overcome them? It's funny you say that because in Brazil, I would say no. And the reason why I say that is because because cricket's not tradition here for us, and that's something I say a lot, because cricket is not a tradition for us, this is not a male sport in Brazil. Uh, cricket is for everyone in Brazil. So in the social projects, we have about 45% females and 55% boys, but high performance is 50-50. So girls play, women play, boys play, men play, everybody can play cricket. Uh, when I started researching about cricket, outside Brazil and then when 2017, when they, the first contact with cricket uh, with other countries and actually say, okay, you, well, let me study English team, let me study Australian team, let me study the South African team. Then I started seeing that ex their exposure was very little and uh, how male was cricket outside Brazil. 
that's my, the first time that I actually realized that it was a, a sport that was still opening the, the, the windows for, for women cricket. So in Brazil, I don't feel that that much. Uh, I feel that a little bit when I am outside Brazil. Uh, and I feel that a little bit when I play with people that are not Brazilian here. Uh, so when the expats, sometimes they look at us like, you play cricket, really? I said, yes, I play cricket. I play for the national team. And so sometimes I, but it's not that, that true. Uh, it's not that strong here for the Brazilians. How important then would you say it is for Cricket Brazil to gain exposure? I think it says a lot when you when we say that Brazil is the first country to have a women's uh, national team contracted before the men's team. And we, they didn't do that. They did that because we are the team with the best opportunity from the country to go forward. So I think it says a lot from the from us, from, from the organization itself, to wear that and say, you know what, this is something good that is happening. Uh, let's make it our our main focus. And let's tell the world that they are, we are the first ones to do that. So I think Cricket Brazil growing shows that non-traditional countries play cricket and we want to get bigger in it. It shows how a social project works uh, well if uh, with the right investment, with the right people, with the right coaching. And it shows that uh, women can. We, we want to be part of it. We want women cricket, women's cricket to go bigger and better every day. So I think these are points that we can't wait to, to, to have more, more of the world knowing about it. And then moving back onto you specifically now. So we've heard all about Brazil, but what about yourself as a captain, as a player? So in T20s, played, hopefully these stats are right, 27 matches, 24 innings, 11 not out, 610 runs with a high score of 81 not out and a really impressive average of 46.92. Tell us about all of that. So tell us about your kind of batting style. Tell us about your attitude to go into matches. Like who is Roberta Moretti Avery once you've got that lid on? You know, I never thought myself as, uh, it's funny because I, my, because my cricket career is so late in life, um, up to 2015, I, I had no idea I could actually play cricket properly. Uh, I didn't understand much of the game, so I was just going over there and having fun. Uh, 2016 onwards, it was the time that when we won the, the, the South American Championship for the second time, and I was invited to go to the States to play. It was very cool. It was the Philadelphia Festival. We, there was one women's game, one women's team playing with 31 men's team. And the captain of my team was Claire Taylor, amazing Claire Taylor. And I was, I met her and I was like, oh my God, these people are the people that are pl played cricket, won World Cups and uh, played World Cups. So it was just then that I said, you know what? I can actually be better because you cannot be what you cannot see. So I started seeing people that played very good cricket. And I think the golf competitiveness came, came in and said, you know what? You want to be one of these people that play well. You want to be one of these people that actually know what they're doing. Uh, it was only then that I said, you know what, I'm going to plan to be a better cricketer. And um, I guess when I go into the cricket field, I'm very focused. I have a plan and very objective. One thing that I have to work on is actually think less and actually just just play with the flow. But I like to be I like to be a leader and I like to be the role model for my team. So I will try to do things that will inspire the people in my team to do the same. Definitely. And we'll come on to captaincy just shortly, but I just wanted to back up your batting stats with your bowling stats as well. So again, 27 matches, 26 innings, and you've taken 39 wickets with best figures of three for one, average of just 6.59. So again, super impressive. So tell us about your all-rounder kind of capabilities and your kind of legacy that you do want to like leave on that pitch too. It's funny on the bowling because uh, last year I decided to move from a fast bowler to a spin bowler. <laughs> Maybe the age and the aching <laughs> helped on that uh, on that matter a little bit. But uh, I, again, I always play. I, I, I want to be dominant where I'm, what I'm doing. And uh, as a bowling, I always believe that I'm going to either get the batsman out or actually understand what they're thinking so I can actually act towards them. So. I love to bowl. Uh, the change of uh, fast to spin happened because I wanted to keep bowling. Because I knew that as a fast bowler, I wasn't going to be able to play anymore, but I wanted to keep playing. So 
It was a long, long change. It has been a long change. I'm still changing it. <laughs> I changed to off spin bowling. Now I decided that I'm better as a leg spinner uh, because I, I love it. I love to bow and I love to be able to set up my field and say, you know what? You're not going to be able to hit this ball. If you hit this ball, you're going to be caught. So uh, I love that kind of uh, thinking towards the game. And uh, I don't think, I, I think I will keep practicing spin until somebody actually say, you know what, Roberta, you're never going to bow again get out because I will never give up on it. I'm sorry, there was a girl selling biscuits. <laughs> you were talking about how you transitioned from being a fast bowler to a spin bowler. I just want to know how easy or difficult you found it. I found it to be very difficult because not only you're changing the whole technique and your run up and everything that you always felt confident with, but also you're changing your mentality. So as a fast bowler, you have one mentality, and but as a spin bowler, you've got to be sm smarter. So I gotta, you've got to play with your field, you've got to play with the person who's doing, uh, you've got to work better on your variations. So all of that, it was very difficult, although now that I'm starting to get more consistent, it felt much more pleasant, it feels more, much more pleasant. But also the change happened two days before we went into lockdown. So as soon as I decided to change, I had two outside practice in the nets and uh, I moved back home, inside home all the time. So I actually trained in my garden. There is a 24 yard garden, <laughs> a very, very narrow. So I actually trained over there every day for the, for the whole of the quarantine. And I think, although it was not great, uh, it helped me actually get the funda some fundamentals right. So yeah, it has been a, an interesting interesting year on this and then just thinking about your captaincy now as well so what kind of leader are you captaincy was not something that came natural to me uh i became captain 2017 for brazil uh i don't think i was prepared <laughs> i don't think i was uh right for it at the start uh, but i think i grew into it a little bit better every day i'm the kind of captain that will support my players i will listen to them i will try to get the best out of everyone in the team. I'm very demanding when I'm, we're playing, we, we get quite, I want them to give me their best and I want them to train their best, but I'm very friendly as well. For a long time, I, my nickname in the team was uh, Big Mom, because I would put everyone up below, <laughs> under my wings and uh, try to take care of their problems and everything else and help them out in every situation. I think the Big Mom is, is moving a little bit now and being more of a nice friend to them and getting their best out of them all the time. I'm a fanatic for the game. I will study everyone, I will study everything, I will watch every kind of matches that are available uh, here in Brazil for us. So I, I use that to, to my advantage and the advantage of my team as well as a captain. So when you are studying the game and stuff, who are you looking at? Who's your kind of icons of the game and the teams that you watch the most? Well, I will watch all the games that I have access from the English team, from the Australian team, New Zealand, South Africa, the big four. The first thing that I started following was the Australian team because on 2017, I went over there for in an internship with a Cricket Australian and it was a great 30 days over there. It was when I met for the first time the Megalanning and Barry and the Megan Shoot. I cried like a baby when I met all these players. <laughs> the same way as I cried like a baby in 2019 when I met Tammy Beaumont and uh, Sarah Taylor and everyone else was like, yeah, every time I meet these players, why do I cry so much? Uh, they probably think I'm a crazy person. But I will, I, I, I get a lot of inspiration from Meg Lanning as a captain. I love her to bits. I love Sophie Divine. I think she's such an amazing player, such an amazing role model for the game. And uh, recently we had a call with uh, Danny White and uh, she is amazing. Such a down-to-earth player. Some, you see by her words how much she works for it. And I felt in love with her since, since then. Uh, so I, I, I can't, ah, and also I cannot, cannot forget this person. I met Charlotte Edwards in 2019 in a training camp. What a person, what a player, what a leader. She is absolutely amazing. And um, well, she, she, she's definitely a person that I look forward, uh, I look to, although I don't see her matches anymore, uh, but as a leader, she's amazing. How easy or difficult have you found captaincy? Difficult, because uh, you realize so much uh, how much you actually have influence in the game by doing, if, you, if, you, if you're doing a good job, you have to be paying attention in every single thing. 
in SF Batsman, in Bowler, in Captain, sometimes it, it, at the start it was a lot. So I saw that it, it affected my performance at the start because I could not think about everything and perform well at the same time. Well, now I'm going to the fourth year of it, it's better because now I know how to actually prepare better so that doesn't affect my performance when I'm in the game. Uh, now I wouldn't see myself not doing it. I like that control. I like to know that I'm paying attention to everything, that every, everybody's in the, going to the same direction. But at this side, it was very difficult because I had to learn so much in such a short period of time. I started being a captain in January. We had our first international tournament in March. So it was not enough time to prepare and learn about everything that I, have to, I had to learn to be a good captain. So it took a, it took a couple of years like, until I actually said, you know what? I know what I'm doing and uh, I'm still learning every single day. But to know that I, I knew what I was doing and my performance was not being affected by being a captain. I'm really interested to hear who the kind of next players are who are coming through in the Brazil ranks. So if you could like name drop any of the exciting players that we should be looking out for, that'd be great. Yes, it's a pleasure. I think we have amazing players in our squad. It's a shame that a lot of them don't speak English or are too shy to speak English because the, the, we would like to expose them more. But I have a, an amazing vice captain, which is called Lindsay Mariano. She's a wicket keeper and she's such a strong bats woman that she broke two bats this season since we started playing in July. I gave her one of my old bats now and I said, I hope it wish, brings you good luck, but <laughs> hopefully it's actually going to last three months on her hand. We have an amazing bowler, bowler uh, an amazing friend as well called Renata Souza. She has been playing in the national squad since when I started as well. She started playing when she was uh, 13, 14 in the national team. And now she's just this amazing bowler. We have a 15-year-old coming through the pathway. We also start in our social projects. Her name is Laura Cardozo. She's amazing. Such a quick bat speed. Amazing bowler as well. So it's exciting. Uh, the, the, the next generation of cricketers coming in Brazil uh, is exciting. I'm 35 years old now, so I don't think I'm going to play for the next 15 years. But they will, and it's gonna, I can't wait to be watching them all the time. What does the next kind of year ahead look like for Brazil cricket? Oh, hopefully a lot of games. We have a tour planned to Argentina, which was postponed from 2020 to now 2021. We are planning to go to Germany in June and play against them and France as a warm-up games for the World Cup qualifiers. We have the World Cup qualifiers in September in USA, which we're very excited about. And we have the South American Championships in November. Uh, that are going to be hosted by Brazil. So we're going to go to Rio de Janeiro and play. Comparing that we didn't have any games whatsoever in 2020, we can't wait to be very busy with Brazil this next year. Yeah, definitely. And those qualifiers, I guess, are going to be the most important for you and for the next kind of couple of years as well, isn't it? Because this is the start of potentially a really exciting journey. Because if you were to win the American qualifiers, can you just talk us through the process of what it kind of takes to get to the World Cup? Yes, uh, that's definitely the one we're more excited about. If we win the World Cup qualifiers in America's region, we go into the next step, which is about 40 days afterwards, when we play against the winners from all the other qualifiers. And from these 10 teams that are over there, two are qualified to go to the World Cup South Africa. So it's a long road. It's a lot of great teams. The European group is just amazing. They are so strong. They are so good. Uh, we watched all uh, their games from the previous qualifiers. We follow their, their teams. We, we look at the names. We know that they are absolutely amazing. So it, it is an interesting and a difficult road, but we can't wait to start. We haven't been this tournament since 2012. I never played it. I never played any qualifiers at, in my cricket career. So we are very excited. We want to do our very best playing against USA, Canada and Argentina that are part of the America's qualifier. Do you have any goals for 2021 for the cricketing season? Yes, uh, we want to be extremely competitive in the World Cup qualifiers. I think that's the main goal. Um, and actually get as many games for Brazil as possible against stronger teams, against different teams. I hope that uh, I'm able to spend some time in UK during the summer and uh, play a little bit more over there as well. But our biggest goal is the World Cup qualifiers. I think that's we have a big whiteboard in our training center with a countdown. Everybody talks about it. It's part of our training every day. So that's the one we're, we're aiming for. There's one more question that I want to quickly sneak in as well, because you mentioned as well that you came to cricket quite late. Was it 28? Yes, 28. What message do you have for young girls, but also women who are coming into the game a bit later on? 
I think I actually spoke about this to a lady who just started playing. She's 32 years of age and she just started and she said, I want to play for the national team. And she's training day in, day out uh, by herself with her husband. She's going to one to one. She's doing everything and she's amazing. She will be very good. It's just like, do not give up. If that's your dream, find a way. If that's your dream, put as a priority in your, your, your day to day life. Train hard. Do not listen to people that will say that you can do this, you can do this. You're going to listen to that so much, but ignore it. If that's your dream, just go for it. You know, make it happen. When you're a woman, it's already difficult, a little bit more difficult because people will not believe that you can do it. And when you're a little bit older, you're going to listen to that 10, time, 10 times more. I had people asking me if I was traveling as a coach of the team when I was already captain playing for the national team for five, four for years people did not believe that i was actually playing so just do not listen to others and follow your dreams that's it perfect thank you so much because i think there's such a huge thing especially when it comes to women and their ages you kind of get written out of the game as soon as you get, kind of get over the 25 mark you kind of get written out of the game because people are like, oh you know yeah she's you know she's passed it whatever and it's like no that's still young and there's still plenty of opportunities and you don't have to be the best you just have to enjoy it so definitely try and to get that message across to people that you can be any age and pick up a bat and enjoy it. You don't have to play for the national side. You're absolutely right. I think it was Sophie Love that said the same, that age is just a number. If you are enjoying, if you're if you're having fun and if you if you want to be doing it, just do it. Uh, you see, you have Catherine Brandt. She's going to be 35 in the next World Cup. And you see how strong and powerful that woman is and uh, how great she bowls and uh, how free she is. You know what? You, you look at these kind of people, you say, you know, I want to keep doing this. That's great. So we're now going to do some quick, fun questions. Alex is an absolute pro at this. I'm more nervous about this than the actual questions before. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite type of music? I love Brazilian pop songs. Kind of a uh, Anita. You have to put in your Spotify later and listen to it. I'm absolutely addicted to her. She's amazing. What was the last book you read? I read The Art of Not Caring. Just to remember that sometimes it's better not to care about a few things. Favourite activity to do that's not related to cricket? Play golf. What was the last TV show you binge watched? Oh, I binge watched The Crown with my husband the whole of this injury time. I think you're about the third person who said that, that we've interviewed, that have actually said they've been binge watching The Crown, so... Must be oh, very it's popular. amazing. I absolutely love it. Who is your best friend in the cricket team? Oh, that's tough. I would say Hanata. She's my best friend there. Do you prefer batting or bowling? Currently, I prefer batting. Do you prefer summers in Brazil or England? Summers in Brazil. And when you come to Brazil one day, you're never going to change that question again. It's at 33 deg degrees outside, beautiful day, playing cricket nicely. Can't miss it. Yeah, my um, aunt and uncle are trying to get my sister and I to Brazil, but with COVID and everything, it's just impossible. Oh yeah, just wait a couple of months. It's, it's going to get better shortly. But for the, until March, I don't think you even can get here. We have uh, one player from the national squad that lives in Bexley. Uh, and our coach also lives in Bexley, and both of them are hopefully trying to get here by April, but we are a little bit worried about that. Hannah, have you got any burning questions you want to ask Roberta? The worst sledging comment that you've ever made? It was not much of a sledging, but the last time I played with the boys, with the men, one of the players came to me, I, I was out duck in the second ball, and the, the guy came to me when I was in the field and said, oh, it's a shame that I wasn't able to, to bowl against you, but you, you, you came out so quick, didn't have a chance. I was like, okay, next time I'll get you. <laughs> I was so upset on that comment. I was like, I can't believe that. But one thing that we need to learn better here is sledging because sledging didn't come with the tradition yet, but we will. Maybe replace it with kindness and see if that works better. <laughs> Just kill them with <laughs> kindness, it's fine. <laughs> I don't think I've got any other questions apart from that one. I always like to hear people's sledges because it's always like, no, was it um, swing, no ding? Big swing, no ding. I like that one. When I was uh, in UK in 2019, there was this 13-year-old girl. I was watching them play and she was so funny because she would be talking all the the silly sledging like, uh, oh, you got more dots than a Dalmatian. <laughs> oh, more misses than her in the eighth. I was like, who is this 13-year-old girl? That is hilarious. It was quite fun <laughs> to learn them. It's a shame they don't translate into Brazilian. Yeah, how would you say that in Brazilian? It, it wouldn't. Because, yes, because we don't... Um, the word dots in Brazil is completely different. 
A lot of the expressions in cricket, we actually just use the English expression anyway. We don't translate them. So sometimes a few of the, the expressions in this legend will not translate to us. So we have to create our own now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's it. Alex, have you got any other questions or are we going to wrap up? I think we should wrap up. I can't think of anything. My brain is gone. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, um, Roberta, for joining us. And I guess the main thing is how can our listeners follow you, follow Cricket Brazil and keep up to date with all your antics? Well, they can find me on Twitter as Moretti Avery and Instagram. Uh, I am as Ela Joga Sim, which means yes, she plays. You can follow also Cricket Brazil as Brazil underline cricket in Twitter and as Cricket Brazil in Instagram. They are very active over there and uh, it's good for everyone to follow what is happening in this side of the world within cricket. Perfect. That's absolutely brilliant. And we honestly can't thank you enough for joining us today. Oh, I just say a big thank you for you. It's very, very nice to talk about cricket in Brazil. And also I love that you guys are focusing in the women's cricket chat. So yeah, definitely be following you every week. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Honestly, thank you. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. And I'll probably badger you again for an article or something at some time just to, you know, now I'm like an official Brazilian fan. So <laughs> I can't get enough, honestly. I love the story and love everything you're doing. So no, the, the story is so amazing. I think I never give enough credit to, to it as I should, maybe because it's so full of uh, things. But our president, Matt Federson, he's just he's such a smart guy such a great professional uh, and uh, following him on this on these steps of making cricket Brazil grow is just has been amazing so whenever you need any information just 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 let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll provide you with anything you need to just make an a zoom call or anything that like that perfect well thank you and hope the rest of the day goes well thank you Hannah thank you Alex see you shortly bye bye Massive thank you to Roberta for coming on the podcast this week and chatting about Cricket Brazil and all things cricket. It's really great to see how far Brazil cricket has come in such a short amount of time. And to all our listeners, if you want to keep up to date with everything we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter at WCricketChat and on Instagram at Women's Cricket Chat. And if you want to give us a like on Facebook, we are Women's Cricket Chat. And if you wanted to give our personal Twitters a follow, Hannah is at HannahT1194 and I'm at Alex Jane Pereira. This has been Women's Cricket Chat. Tune in next time.